afternoon, everybody. I hope um, that I am coming through loud and clear. My name is Sue Brewster, and I'm the Chief Executive of Auckland Medical Research Foundation. We fund medical research, and we are the largest independent funder of medical research in New Zealand. A very warm welcome to the second of our online series of COVID-19 research presentations. This is about research that has been made possible by the $500,000 fast tracked COVID-19 research fund. So last week, we were fortunate enough to hear from Professor Meryn Gott, who presented on the impact of isolation on our older communities. And of course, the impact of that during COVID-19. If you weren't able to join us for that presentation, you'll find the video available online. So please do take the time to have a listen after this. But today, of course, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Matthew Rosscrooge, who will be presenting today uh, on his research on nurse wellbeing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So Matthew, has, he is a health economist and he has been a decade of um, experience in as a mental health support worker. So um, perfectly um, able to do research into this nurse wellbeing during the pandemic. Um, but before I hand over to Matthew, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you, our supporters out there who have made this type of life-changing research possible and so many other forms of medical research possible. We really couldn't do what we do without you and our uh, researchers certainly couldn't do what they do either. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Ross Rouge and he will present on his research on nurse wellbeing during the pandemic. Thank you. Kia ora tātou. Oh, kia ora. Ko Matthew Ross Rouge tōku ingoa, nō te ati awa, nā te tama hau. Um, so I'm Matt Rosscridge. I'm a senior lecturer at um, Massey University in the School of Economics and Finance and co-director of um, Te Aurangaho, which is our Māori Business Research Centre. But it's an absolute pleasure to be here to um, present to you online, hopefully the technology works for us, um, around COVID-19 impact on nurse wellbeing, identification, sustainability and mitigation. And I think the first thing is just to make clear, it's only the first 100 days, so um, this is a 300 day project. We're roughly a third of the way through, so we're just starting some of our data collection now. So we won't be talking about any results in this presentation. It'll just be talking about um, the study that we're doing, the motivations, um, some of the survey that we've designed, um, and some of the impact that we're looking to have. And also some of the challenges of doing research in the New Zealand environment. Okay, uh, so the first thing I want to talk about there is why do we care about nurses? Um, we know that our nurse workforce is the largest body of health professionals with just about 60,000. So roughly four times the number of nurses uh, working in New Zealand compared to the number of doctors. Um, despite being such a large um, professional workforce, they receive surprisingly little um, coverage and attention. You often don't see um, nurses in primetime media. Um, you don't hear as much about um, the pressures and obligations on nurses compared to other parts of the health workforce, um, which is surprising because they're essential to the provision of both community, um, clinical oh, and surgical health. So pretty much across the spectrum of healthcare that we provide, um, you will find nurses involved in the administration or the provision of that healthcare. Um, so they're essential, they're a large body, but sometimes their work can be a little bit invisible um, or a little bit marginalised. Um, often it's not the, um, the sexy sort of work that um, makes it into the papers or makes it onto ER. Um, it's the doctors and the, um, some of the more high profile professionals that tend to capture that. Uh, so there is a little bit of a lack of research into the well-being of nurses. And again, we got some nurse sensitive indicators. So those are um, indicators that measure the um, impact of the presence or absence of nurses in providing healthcare. And those nurse sensitive indicators show that there's a real importance um, of having nurses if you want to achieve the best possible or even just positive outcomes uh, for patients. Uh, we're also seeing some ongoing disruption in the nurse workforce, which is um, 
really difficult to see. I think it's been about two years of industrial action and um, or um, pushing for better working um, paying conditions for among nurses. Um, and that disruption in trying to push for better recognition is impacting on the health and well-being of the nurse workforce. Um, the other thing that I think has been particularly um, obvious and a little bit in the media actually around COVID-19 is how much nurses are expected to place themselves uh, and their whānau uh, and their friends in danger as a result of their frontline roles. Um, you see it both in COVID-19 but also with the rise in the number of assaults um, and the abuse that nurses get in a medical setting uh, and of course their exposure to um, their occupational exposure to disease. And so there is that concern around the, um, the dangers that nurses are exposed to and how that impacts back on them and their whānau. Uh, and all of this is mixing in to create a um, workforce that's under a huge amount of stress and we're really concerned about the sustainability of our nurse workforce. I mean, can we maintain, I mean, we've got say 60,000 or near enough nurses now, but as we have an increasingly aging population, um, and increasing longevity, a lot more medicalized intervention earlier in people's lives. Um, how are we going to sustain that nurse workforce when it probably needs to be growing and yet we're struggling or unable to maintain the level of um, workforce that we have? Especially in a globally competitive market where nurses can just about move um, anywhere and find work. Okay, so that was setting a bit of scene about why we um, care about nurses. The research team itself, um, two of the researchers um, who are far more qualified to be here talking to you today, but I, I guess I've got the um, big mouth. Um, Margaret and Catherine are both registered nurses. Um, they're both health researchers. Margaret's in health communication and Catherine's in um, nursing. So she researches quite broadly in the health space. Um, and they're both qualitative researchers um, who spent, I think, several decades in both cases as registered nurses. Um, I'm really supporting them, doing the paperwork, doing the data work, doing some of the surveying support. Um, I'm an economist, um, come from a heavily quantitative background, um, a lot in Māori health and wellbeing, um, but also I had previously worked in the Ministry of Health, so um, have some policy experience there. Okay. I see you're just talking about how the team came together. Uh, Margaret and I uh, worked next to each other in the hallway, even though we were in different parts of the university or different schools within the university. And so we got to talking about our shared experiences working in the health sector uh, and our shared concerns for well-being, um, particularly in those um, in nursing and allied health. I mean, the mental health sector where I worked was um, shocking for um, bullying and pressures and a lack of professional development at the time. Um, so there were though, we were both concerned about well-being and the pressures on staff. Um, and Margaret had previously worked with Catherine um, on research into registered nurses' well-being and workplace pressures, particularly um, the different um, cultural and ethnic and religious values and groupings and how they all um, are coming together uh, to work in that nursing setting. Um, a lot of my work is in surveys, as I said. I was a health economist um, with the National um, Health Committee, which I think has been disestablished now in the Ministry of Health. Um, so I'll, my role there was largely in looking at what could and couldn't be funded um, within the health setting and trying to um, move, remove funding from interventions that either didn't have good evidence around them or um, were very expensive relative to alternative interventions. Um, so we've all got a practical experience, um, both before our time in academia, working sort of on, I guess, in the front lines of um, as nurses and mental health workers, and then subsequently in our academic um, roles, working on um, in well-being, um, and in my case, in costings and um, trying to apply policy. So. That blend, we're quite excited about it. It means that we can do some pretty interesting things. Um, and hopefully this research, which is um, sort of a mixed methods um, research that we're taking here, is the start of an ongoing series of research into the well-being of allied and nursing health professionals. Um, 
So in terms of prior research, I hinted before that Margaret um, and Catherine were both involved in carrying out that first New Zealand study on the cultural influence uh, um, of the cultural influences on perceptions, practices, and cross-cultural communication interfaces between registered nurses from diverse ethnicities. Uh, it's a nice way of saying that they were looking at the um, the way that culture influences people's um, feelings and behaviours while they're um, working as registered nurses, uh, with a particular role and in how um, interest in how those different ethnicities come into interplay there. Um, that research found a clear evidence of macro level stress, uh, and particularly teamwork, uh, management factors, and organisational culture were the three um, main areas that contributed to macro level stress among nurses. Um, but as long with those big sort of macro things, there were also micro level stresses that were just occurring day in and day out. They were small, they were difficult to um, manage and to address. And those were things like um, difficulties in communication, horizontal and vertical communication uh, within the nursing um, practice, um, as well as clinical and moral stresses. Um, people finding um, difficulty in um, the way that they were carrying out their work and interacting with their colleagues and patients and all sorts of things like that. So overall, there was clear evidence um, from the project of a stressed workforce and that that was stress was having a real impact in, on nurse well-being. Um, and sometimes that impact resulted in staff turnover or a, a strong intention to leave, um, and also on sentinel events. Um, when a worker is stressed, both their productivity falls, their intention to remain falls, but also they start to um, make mistakes. And in a, a medical setting, those mistakes are incredibly dangerous. Um, so there's a few quotes there uh, as evidence of the stresses that were experienced um, by registered nurses. Um, so the first two were from the New Zealand system, I think, so, um, sorry, were um, New Zealand born and I think some of the last quotes were from migrants. So the first one there, I think the negative implications on us as New Zealand nurses are huge. I sometimes feel out of my depth working in my own work environment and I feel like I'm a minority. Another one said, I um, left this area of nursing due to burnout, frustration at the system, not caring for their staff, patients and family, that money and budget came first, not people. And so you can see from the rest of the quote, it's a real sort of um, almost sense of disenfranchisement, disillusionment um, among some of the nurses that were interviewed in this earlier study. Uh, and it all paints this pressure, um, picture of a really stressed workforce that is um, facing a diverse range of pressures, um, both in terms of working in complex and high pressure work environments and also in communicating amongst themselves and with their, um, with their managers. And I think sometimes there seems to be a theme of um, burnout just really, I mean, complex rosters, long working hours, um, sometimes unpaid work, or the expectation of being available for overtime. All of these things were um, having a real impact on nurse stress. Um, so from that prior research, we know that nurses are stressed. It's no secret. Um, and we know that we need to improve the work conditions of nurses to address the stress, to try and improve nurse well-being improve retention and improve their psychosocial health. So this is kind of where we started from with this COVID-19 project. Uh, so events like COVID-19 placed that new stress onto the workforce. So we were, we were interested both in if we've got this really stressed um, workforce that's struggling to um, cope with just the everyday realities of being a, new, a nurse at the moment. What happens when you then add on to it um, COVID-19? So you add on this whole new, incredibly stressful um, and pressurized environment for nurses to work on with new rules around and rapidly changing rules around PPE, um, new rules around distancing. Also, I think there was a lot of expectation to be present at work, but because electives were cancelled or um, because there were less patients visiting clinics, the actual day-to-day -day work kind of fell away. So uh, there was a huge sense of apprehension um, and um, unsettled work environments. 
And so we were interested, well, okay, does this exacerbate the existing stresses? If we had managed those existing stresses in the first instance, would it make coping with COVID-19 easier for nurses um, or mitigating some of the issues of COVID-19 easier for them? Or does COVID-19 create a whole new set of stresses in which case, yes, it's still important to mitigate the existing um, issues facing nurses, but we also need to look at what the, um, how we're going to mitigate these one-off, um, I want to say acute, but in some ways when you're looking at um, COVID-19, it's almost becoming chronic. I mean, we could be having these same conversations in one or two years time. Um, so do we need to look at, say, in a pandemic example, although there are other um, large scale medical events which might place similar stress on nurses, how important is it to address the underlying and existing stresses that nurses face? And how important is it to have plans in place to address the new and arising issues facing nurses as a result of um, events like COVID-19? Um, and there seems to be a mounting body of research. Um, I know I heard um, our Prime Minister say this morning that um, COVID-19 is a one in a hundred year event. There seems to be some debate, and I'm by no means an epidemiologist, um, so yeah, but uh, that COVID-19 isn't going to be unique and that in a globalized world, we can expect this to perhaps happen more often. Um, so, uh, it would be good that if we're going to have these events that stretch our nurse workforce, we have a plan in place to deal with um, the stresses that are arising from them, but also we're making a sustained effort to address those existing stresses so that we're in the best possible position, our workforce is as happy and healthy and supported as possible to be able to um, deal with these um, large scale events. Okay, so the project itself that we're working on has two research questions that we're looking to address. The first one there is to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the well-being of nurses in the Auckland area. Um, and I guess we're really looking at the impact relative to the existing and new stresses um, that nurses are facing. And the other one there is to identify strategies for resilience and mitigation to support um, or say, support nurse well-being during this and future crises. Um, in terms of impact there, what we're hoping to achieve as a result of this research is a record to capture some of those nurses' voices about their experience because we only have a very short window to collect data on COVID-19. Um, Short, I mean, in the grand scheme of things. Okay, it might go for another year or two, but it's still, there's a time pressure to get um, an idea of um, what it was like to be a practicing nurse during this time. Um, and well, it's still fresh in people's minds, the pressures they faced um, and what day-to-day -day nursing was like in this situation. So there's a real time critical element, which is where we're incredibly grateful for the um, funding from AMRF that allowed us to roll this project out very rapidly. Um, and not miss that window of opportunity. Um, we're happy to click that and also to use those voices um, and the findings from the survey to help inform um, policy and strategies around um, uh, increasing resilience or finding strategies to mitigate um, the pressures resulting from COVID-19, um, helping to protect that nursing workforce um, during this and the future crises. So I guess it's just adding a little bit of evidence, um, a little bit of research, because we know that um, good policy is evidence-based policy. Um, so we really want governments that um, create their policy based on um, scientific evidence. And if no research is being conducted in these areas, then uh, the policymakers are really flying blind or they're relying on overseas research, which might be um, might not be very well contextualized to the New Zealand um, context. Okay, um, so the research itself is designed in two interwoven research arms. Uh, the first one there is a quantitative arm. This is perhaps where um, I take more of the lead, although everybody is involved in every aspect of the research. Uh, so the quantitative arm includes an online survey of nurses. At this stage, we're just looking at the Auckland region. 
including Waitemata, Auckland and Counties Monaco DHBs, um, but we're not restricting ourselves to hospital settings. We're um, looking to survey any nurse who works in the Auckland region. And the aim of that is to understand that generalised impact of COVID-19 on the stress and well-being experienced by nurses. So surveys are very good at building and increasingly um, policymakers are looking at for statistical evidence um, to support policy interventions. Um, a well qualitative research allows you to get a very, very in-depth um, understanding of what happened to a collection of individuals. Um, increasingly, there's, uh, I think, a move, maybe a little bit of a bias um, towards uh, being able to support those qualitative experiences with um, some numbers, with some statistical evidence that, yes, across the general population, we also see um, these trends. So these trends are illustrated by the qualitative research and generalized by the um, quantitative research. And having both allows you to um, have a lot more influence, I think, on um, in policy and intervention um, creation. Uh, and it also allows you to create quite a holistic picture of the issue that you're trying to investigate. So the quantitative arm is that generalized impact. And then we've got a qualitative arm which is looking at in-person, although um, we're still a little bit concerned, we're still keeping an eye on whether we might end up back in lockdown. Uh, our interviews are set for the second half of this year. Well, I suppose we're in the second half of this year, so in the next couple of months. So we'll be looking at digitally assisted through Zoom if we end up back in lockdown. Um, okay, so the quantitative arm itself, uh, we are, uh, ready to go live with our survey. We're just waiting on a couple of issues that I'll talk about later on to resolve. Um, so the quantitative arm itself is a survey of New Zealand nurses organisation members who are nurses employed in the Auckland region. Um, so those are people who are in our sample frame. Uh, we're doing a survey online via Qualtrics and we're looking for at least 375, although um, so about 2.6% of the 14 and a half thousand New um, Auckland nurses. Uh, prior experience um, and a little bit of wishful thinking, we're hoping to get that number up closer to 10%. Um, so maybe 1,500 to 2,000 would be a um, fantastic sample. But I'll be, look, I'll be happy if we get over that 400 mark. Uh, we want a survey that takes 10 to 15 minutes to complete, which is surprisingly difficult to design. Um, and survey participants are able to opt in um, to be interviewed. And then we'll be using a range of statistics. I personally um, favor regression analysis to start to look uh, for statistical patterns um, and some statistical evidence around generalized experiences of well-being and stress during COVID-19, uh, but also to help inform the questions that we um, ask people in the qualitative interviews. So we're using, quite often you use qualitative interviews to inform the survey design. And we're doing it the other way around in this particular study because we're really interested in um, getting a deep understanding of the mitigation strategies that people deployed in helping to manage um, their COVID-19 ex um, experiences. And so we're doing the quantitative first to get a broad picture of what might have, um, of what the general population experienced. And then we're taking from there, because um, we want to manage the length of time that these interviews take. Um, nurses are busy, it's um, a lot of, um, pre, uh, it's a lot to ask of somebody to spend an hour um, or half an hour interviewing with you. And so we really want to refine the questions that we're asking in that qualitative space. Uh, so that's why the quantitative arm is running first. In terms of design, um, designing surveys is soul destroying. I've done a few now. Um, every single one has its unique challenges. Uh, this one has actually been okay to design. We've got a fantastic team that I'm working with, but there's been um, just complexities, I think, around managing the demands, uh, particularly because we know nurses are quite stressed. And also, um, that's one of the first ones where we put a lot of effort into optimizing the survey for mobile. Um, devices. Most of the previous ones that we've done um, have been longer surveys that have been designed probably for the desktop. And so that's been interesting as well. Uh, so we have survey design phase um, and then 
pre-test with um, colleagues usually or people or students, people who are handy for and available to um, do some basic pre-testing and then go through a round of piloting, um, usually with nurses and try and refine um, the survey further. If that round of piloting found relatively few issues, we would skip that second round of piloting. But in our particular survey, we found that um, the survey was just too long still. You know, it was a bit too much of a load to ask about participants. So we've had to make further refinements in doing that second round of piloting to make sure that we've got the expectations around time, right? Survey goes live, um, data cleaning and coding, which is a fun and very long process of working with the data to get it ready for analysis um, and then knowledge dissemination. So going out um, to stakeholders and presenting our findings. Um, set of um, five broad question themes there. First one is around the um, factors impacting the participants. So looking at the participants' socio-demographics, uh, their workplaces and their work patterns to try and get a baseline understanding of the person from a statistical point of view. Uh, then we got a block of questions asking about well-being. So um, just a simple question, uh, um, overall, how satisfied are you with your life uh, from zero to 10? Uh, and looking at also work and non-work satisfaction. And these are some of our outcome measures that we're interested in. A block of questions around pre-existing stress. So um, picking up on the previous work that um, Margaret and Catherine has done around teamwork management, organizational culture and workload. And then largely um, repeating that in the context of COVID-19 uh, and introducing issues around changes in workload, um, PPE, communication um, and communication about PPE seems to be another issue that a lot of people have has risen as, as being very complex during um, COVID-19, the early um, weeks as well. And then importantly, looking at the, um, uh, the sustainability and mitigation factors. So what did, what behaviors did people adopt? Who did they go to see for help? Um, how did management help support nurses during this time? Uh, how important was patient encouragement or um, co-worker or managerial encouragement in helping um, mitigate the negative um, psychological or um, well-being impacts of COVID-19? Um, so that's the quantitative arm, which is going live um, as soon as we can get our window open. Uh, the qualitative arm is a series of semi-structured interviews one-on-one, -on -one, and they're looking to further explore the existing and new stresses that were picked up in the survey, but really delve into how these strategy, um, how these stresses are managed by nurses. Um, and we could be looking at the uh, strategies that they personally adopted to manage stress, but also what did their whānau do that helped to support them? Um, and what about in the workplace context? What, what did your work do that helped to um, support you and minimize or mitigate those stressful um, uh, activities that you're involved in? Um, so really with those interviews, we're trying to build up that picture of, um, that deeper picture of within the individual and how did you manage that stress? What were the strategies? And I guess the goal is to be able to take what the, um, we're finding in the interviews, supported by the statistical um, data out of the survey, to be able to build up, okay, here's some advice, here are some interventions, here's some policy, here's some plans that we can put in place at a um, national or organizational level um, to help to support nurses through these really difficult times. Um, so we've got a few initial reflections. Again, we haven't really started data collection yet. We've just um, been going through the piloting and the early um, phase of establishing the project. Uh, first thing there that um, I think I surprised me, even though I um, didn't seem to surprise um, Catherine and Margaret so much, given that they are, were nurses, but I was really surprised at how intense the pressure was on our nursing workforce. Um, there is a lot of stress there. I, that's really a um, concerning area of work that needs to be um, supported, I think, um, uh, probably at a national level, far better than it is. Um, and COVID-19 seemed to only add to that baseline level of stress. So it didn't seem like there was a lot or any mitigation of the baseline level of stress. We just saw an increase 
um, or a new layer of stress added on top of an already demanding job. Um, one thing, and I guess because in New Zealand we didn't have widespread community transmission, um, some of the stress that um, people we've talked to have reported is more about the, the threat, um, the looming threat of COVID-19 and the unknownness of what it might look like if and when it turns up in um, New Zealand. So that creates sort of a level of apprehension um, in a health setting. You're getting nervous every time somebody comes in with a um, cough or a cold you are starting to change the way that you interact with people in the workplace setting. Just that the whole, um, I guess it's almost an existential threat, is sort of that looming risk that things may go wrong or that you're suddenly going to have to um, change your workplace or work patterns. You're suddenly going to have to deal with this um, looming crisis. And so it's that threat that I think was adding a lot to the stress um, for our new Zoom workforce, given that we didn't have widespread community transmission. Um, we were surprised as we've looked through the international um, research on the impact of COVID-19 on nurses, both how little there is um, and how mixed the results are. So there's a, quite a few studies that seem to minimize or don't seem to report, not quite a few. There's a couple of studies that don't seem to be showing a lot of um, stress on nurses. Um, there was even, I think, some um, suggestion that perhaps the stresses were lowered because there were, um, they had something, there was something going on that you could focus on and that um, things like your uh, elective surgeries, people presenting to clinics, those sorts of um, demands on your work had died down. Um, but at the same time, there are um, studies that seem to suggest that there was a huge increase in stress um, resulting from COVID-19. So really mixed results there. Um, the literature that is available is really generalized um, and it doesn't do a lot to m move from are people stressed, yes or no, to okay, so what do we do about it? And I think that's where our research is really trying to um, add some more impact is helping to be, um, people talk about what to do about the stress that comes in from COVID-19. Uh, and there's just a need for research that reflects the new new Ze uh, unique New Zealand environment. We know that um, we have a unique age cohort, ethnic cohort. Um, we have a unique um, health service and structure um, with lots of competing demands on nurses that might not be well generalized from overseas experiences. So this research itself, I think research always has um, things go wrong. And this research has been no exception, although I'd probably say it's been one of the, um, it's both been fast and great fun, but also surprisingly um, uh, difficult research to get up and off the ground at times. It's probably had more than its fair share of curveballs. Uh, so one of the ones we found there is some of the administrative hurdles. So um, because the um, COVID-19 round was announced really quickly, we had to think of the project quickly and get it up and running. There's quite a compressed amount of time available for us to do a huge amount of administration, uh, such as get a um, formal ethics approval um, and go through designing a survey, getting access to all the software we need. So there was just a lot of administration that we had to deal with in a very compressed amount of time. Um, there's always a little bit of a, um, when you're applying for ethics, a little bit of a gamble between how quickly you get the application in and how much information you're able to provide and then how quickly you'll get your ethical approval. Um, uh, given the short time frames, we made a real effort to get our ethics application done as quickly as possible. Took a bit of a gamble there and unfortunately for us that gamble didn't pay off and we were required to um, uh, generate a bit more documentation uh, before we could get our final approval and with the ethics committees only meeting every, every month that probably slowed us down by a couple of weeks there. And then that started to create snowballing delays. We also found um, kitchen sinks. Um, the temptation with every survey you design is that you want to ask everybody everything because you think every question is so important that it has to be in there. We were really, really trying to keep our survey as short as possible. Uh, still ended up being 30 minutes long, which is far too long um, for a busy nurse who's probably doing that during and doing the survey during her break. So we had to go through and do another round of pretty radical cuts, cutting out questions that I was very interested in to help it fit within that 10 to 15 minute time frame that we're targeting. 
Um, and our main partner, NZNO, has been, um, as I alluded to earlier, working really hard uh, to improve the working conditions for nurses. And unfortunately, um, when we were ready to press um, go on the survey, uh, it was a really busy period for the NZNO uh, with industrial action. And so we had to um, pause our survey for a little bit longer until a more suitable window um, was open for them to be um, working with and communicating for, uh, to the um, nursing. So yeah, lots of curveballs, lots of strange things going on. Hasn't actually impacted. Um, I see we're out of time. But, um, a well-designed project probably has, I always try and get about a quarter of the time available in the total project where you can move things around. And so we've actually managed to um, uh, have very little impact on the overall delivery time frame of the project there. Um, I guess just quickly, um, the going further and the type of impact that we're looking to have with this study, um, really we're using this Auckland study as both a way of finding a lot of information within a um, specific geographic region of New Zealand, but also as a bit of a pilot for if the study could be taken out at a national level. So depending on how the Auckland study goes, we might look at um, funding or support to roll this out as a national survey. Um, and also to look at um, other areas of healthcare, um, so allied health. Uh, we, of course, want to provide reports and go and see um, uh, people in the DHBs and in, um, large organisations and organisations in general who um, might be interested in how they can start to um, put in place policies and interventions um, or advice that helps um, nurses deal with stress, particularly relating to COVID-19. Uh, need to be engaged in the media. Uh, researchers, for reasons I've never quite been able to puzzle out, seem to often be terrified of getting in front of the media. Uh, and I think it's incredibly important, especially given how small New Zealand is, that um, more researchers are um, trained and given the confidence to get in front of um, the AM show or breakfast or well, whatever it happens to be and um, talk about their research and explain why their research is very important. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the project. Um, thank you guys very much for listening. It has a few details there um, and some of the organisations that are involved. Um, I think I'll pause there. I'll just see whether um, on chat there are any questions that came through. So the question here is whether I can give historical examples of um, an exam historical example or two of research that's created a positive change for nurses in New Zealand or internationally. Um, again, I'm probably gonna have to show my ignorance here um, because I don't work a lot in the nurse wellbeing space. Um, I'm trying to think of where I've seen nurse research being applied, um, or research into nurse wellbeing being applied. I know the study that I talked about earlier that Margaret and Catherine had been involved in um, they've worked quite closely with um, New Zealand Nurses Organisation and I'm sure others to help to um, move from the research space. So they found out a lot about how um, uh, values, ethnicity, culture um, and work groups um, can uh, work together to um, mitigate or if they're not working together, create uh, increased tension. Um, in a workplace setting. So I think that research has then been used to help to inform things like communication strategies um, and mitigation strategies to help to manage um, intergroup conflict in a nurse setting. Um, there'll be a lot of far more pragmatic um, projects. So, I mean, even things like when to take breaks, uh, human factors like how to um, take notes, how to, um, how to reduce the cognitive demand on nurses when they're filling in paperwork, when they are administering drugs, um, when they're involved in lots of different aspects of their life. Um, so there are some examples, but again, I'm not an expert on nurse wellbeing research. Um, I take a far more broader approach. Um, Okay, so uh, the next question there is how can nurses who want to participate get involved and take the survey? Uh, so we'll be working with the New Zealand Nurses Organisation to get a, um, uh, these are, it's for nurses in the Auckland region only. 
we'll get that link sent out through NZNO. Uh, we'll also uh, be putting the link to the survey on a few different Facebook groups. We might ask the Auckland Medical Research Foundation to host the link to the survey on their website as well, um, or on their Facebook, I should say. So we'll be looking at just trying to um, get the link out as broadly as possible within the Auckland region. Well, I think that's uh, the questions that have been asked so far of Matthew. So I'd like to take this opportunity just to wrap up. Um, and I know you'll all join me in thanking Dr. Ross Scrooge for his wonderful talk today um, and the information and survey that they'll be undertaking over the next month or two. So I guess what's really great to know is that this research, this type of research is actually happening here and that what it hopes to inform is mitigation strategies for nurses that are such a pivotal part of our healthcare system. I'm sure all of us at some stage or other have benefited from the care uh, and the professionalism of our nurse workforce. Um, so, we so welcome this research and um, wish Matthew and the team all the very best with the research they're undertaking. So, and Matthew, we can't wait to actually hear the results um, when they come out. So we will do follow up on uh, all of this research that's taking place, of course, and be coming out with the um, after study uh, results as well. So um, that will be, as Matthew indicated in his timeline towards the end of the year, early next year. So um, you'll have to stay tuned. So on that note, um, we will be back next week, same time, same place. And next week we'll be hearing from Dr. Daniel Furkett, who will be um, presenting on his research into antiviral treatments for COVID-19. So I'm sure there's a lot of worldwide research going on on that space at the moment as well. So we'll hear from Daniel, um, but I think today the other point I'd like to make is that the, the research that Dr. Ross Scrooge and his team are doing is going to be quite unique to New Zealand because obviously in other countries they're having such a different experience of COVID-19 um, and the incredible stresses that come with that. So, uh, you know, we will have a very different uh, data set than a lot of other countries in the world. So it'd be very interesting to compare and contrast. And I can see Matthew shaking his head at that one as well. So um, look, from all of us here at Auckland Medical Research Foundation, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Ross Scrooge and um, all the very best. We'll see you back here next week. Thank you.